coming up, a special edition of Need to Know by the People. 100 local citizens spend a day talking about our health care system, sharing their experiences, opinions, and ideas. Rochester's news magazine since 1997. This is Need to Know. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm WXXI Television News Director Julie Phillip. A few weeks ago, WXXI and Rochester Institute of Technology took part in a national initiative called By the People. Hundreds of Americans gathered at sites across the nation to talk about top issues. Here it was health care. In this special edition of Need to Know by the People, Part 3, we're going to look at some of the questions local citizens asked, including one about who's in charge when it comes to your health care, doctors or insurance companies. Hello. Uh, my question is, how does insurance company oversight impact the ability of health care providers to deliver quality care and receive adequate compensation? Uh -huh. And the question um, basically is how much are the doctors controlled by the insurance company and the care that they give? Um, there is a limitation as to how much I can receive in reimbursement based on the contractual allowance that I have with the insurance company. So if I choose not to accept that contractual allowance, then that cost goes directly to the patient. Um, so to a certain extent, yes, there is a limitation as to how much I can charge as far as reimbursement. I think the other part of your question is how many tests and things can I order based on what the insurance companies say. And again, part of this is trying to contain cost um, to deliver care. So if there, is some, if there are some studies that show that using a generic equivalent of a medication will save several billion dollars, then that's something that we should do. And when you come into my office, the first thing that pops into my mind is not the generic equivalent, but the drug that I might have just used five seconds ago, or the drug that I know works the best, or the drug that had the best outcomes, or uh, the, the latest research, which might not necessarily be the best thing for you. And we need to stop and take a moment to think about the cost of the medication, the side effect profile. So all of that builds in, into it. So yes, there are some limitations where there are prior authorizations that I have to do for certain types of medications, for certain types of services, such as x-rays and uh, other technological services for uh, authorization to refer to specialists. So there, there is quite a bit of balance as to um, what a physician can and cannot do. But there, you also still have quite a bit of autonomy. Uh, Elise, if I could follow up a little bit, uh, uh, earlier comment. You said you, ha you have to see four patients an hour just to cover your overhead. Right. Well, assuming there's eight hours a day, five days a week, that's 40 hours, and, and, and you have to do more than your overhead. I mean, you have to, the overhead doesn't include, I don't know, I don't know there's got to be you, some. You got it. I, I work about 12 to 15 hours a day. And then uh, how many days a week? Uh, five days a week. Okay, so now. Well, I mean, I'm on call 24-7, 360, okay. but what I'm getting so at, that's seven 15, days a week for me. But, but that's 15 minutes a, a person. 15 minutes but, but a person. you've got to cover more than your overhead. That's right. So therefore, you're down to what, 10 minutes a person? About seven and a half minutes a person. So seven and a half minutes a person is all you can allow in order to put food on your own table. Basically. And, 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 uh, and, and cover your, your overhead. Basically. And, 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 and you're working, you know, 60, 70 hours a week. And so the, the challenge is how do you provide a, an encounter where you are meeting the needs of the patient within a limited amount of time? And there are flexible ways that you can, that you can do that. And, uh, Tim, yeah. Um, as usual, I'm going to dodge and slightly alter your question, which is, I think you asked two questions. How do insurance companies ultimately lead to improved quality, do they? And does their oversight amount to too much control of physicians? Um, I think in the, the, the premise of the question is really, what do insurance companies, in fact, contribute to health care? Or are they, in fact, a drain on the system? And I would simply ask the question a little differently. How much of the money insurance companies make for the sake of an insurance company ends up contributing to health care? It's not enough. So that may not be the way we want to structure the health care system in the first place. Okay. David's going to have some fun at the end here. Okay, Stuart. I'll try to stick to the original question. I think. Uh, uh, you know, we talk a lot about systems, but basically human nature here is at play. Doctors are people, the people who run hospitals and health systems are people, the people who run insurance companies are people, and uh, we're all subject to human nature. I think people in the field 
are basically uh, well motivated around providing good patient care and doing things uh, right. Uh, like anybody, um, we respond uh, more effectively to challenges and to incentives and to the learnings from uh, different and better ways of, uh, of doing things. And what I mentioned uh, in response to the last question, I think the federal government's emphasis on uh, patient safety and quality outcomes and providing different ways of looking at things and actually providing some tools uh, have helped uh, specifically hospitals respond and provide a higher level of, of, of care. I think some things that um, insurance companies do uh, have, the, uh, you know, have the same result. There's a policy now where patients and, uh, who need a CT scan for a variety of things, if doctors want that, they now have to go through a process patient by patient to get that approved prior to uh, it being provided. Uh, it seems to be, uh, from the point of view of doctors, uh, some basic tests for some basic things uh, that has become the standard of care. One thing that's going to result, rather than have their office staffs uh, go through all the steps to get this approval, not being able to schedule it while the patient is in the office, it's going to be much easier for the doctor to say, you need a CT, go down the street to the hospital and have the CT. The hospital is then in the position of a higher number of patients coming into the emergency department and the CT and the hospital uh, you know, being overloaded. So I think, um, I think in fairness uh, to Medicare, Medicaid, and the insurance companies, there are incentives, there are uh, directions that uh, have the impact of improving care, and there are those that are counterproductive. Uh, 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 Fran Sandy or Joe, do you want to have a, a comment before? David has that. I want to hear David's response. Okay. <laughs> David, you're going to pass, Joe? Uh, let me sort of, you know, skip around on, on the comments that have been made. I, I don't know that I'm going to get every one of them. Um, you know, on, on, the, on the issue of value, which is the one that, that receives some, some applause, uh, I mean, the, the alternative is that the companies aren't there and either have government or you don't have insurance at all and, and there's no pooling mechanism. And, it, and it's self-pay. And uh, if you were to draw a contrast in particular to government, and there's been some researchers uh, from Massachusetts, from Harvard, that you know, talk about you know, a Medicare for all type of situation. They say the administrative cost is 2 or 3% in Medicare. I mean, that number is right uh, if you look at Medicare experience versus an insurance company that's you know, running you know, between, typically a New York company, between 10 and 15%. Okay. What's belied in those statistics, and this is a very, very important piece of information, is it costs three times as much to take care of a Medicare patient. And so you take that 3%, you multiply it by, by 3, you get to 9, you don't see a huge difference. Okay. You also see Medicare contracting with the private sector for administration. It's really just Medicare policies that are out there that are, are governing what's done versus what's not. And, you know, People need to, to remember that. Then go back to what I said earlier about choice and about pluralistic financing. Uh, let me digress, and, and uh, you know, Nana um, and Stuart may have a comment here. Uh, we have in Rochester one of the best neurosurgery departments in the world. In the world. People come from all over the world to have Paul Mauer and Webb Pilcher you know, do surgery on, on their backs and, and, and on their heads. Um, you know, rock star types of people, if you saw the list of patients, and I'm not going to engage in a HIPAA violation to tell you who they are, but some of them play for the NFL, for example. Um, they have one fellow coming out of those, that program each year. Okay? You can only train one neurosurgeon per year because you need about a million people in the population base to see enough disease to do that type of training. And in the last 11 years, until a year ago, they did not keep one of those. They all went someplace else because they could make more money someplace else. So Dr. Pilcher came to me and he said, you know, they could go to, to Houston or they can go to, uh, to Virginia and make five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000 being a neurosurgeon straight out of fellowship. Can you help us? Because if you look at who's in my group, you know, most of them are in their 50s and we're going to have access to care problems. My company showed up and provided a $4 million grant, and now we have solved that problem. Okay? That's the value of pluralistic financing. 
Okay? If you only have one source of money, you don't have the ability to solve that problem. And going back to your other questions about access to care and the extent to which we affect Dr. Harris's practice or uh, you know, Stewart's comment about the radiology preauthorization, there's a state law that's out there called external review. Okay? Any time you know, we have said no because something is viewed as medically not necessary, experimental, investigational, conditions like that out of contract, okay, a patient has the right to go to the external review panel. Every insurance company in New York State is subject to that law. When we have a denial, we go through a series of appeals. The last appeal says, you have the rights to go to external review. You know, some patients go do that. Some people go there. And about half the time, you know, our, our decisions are overturned. Not 100 percent of the time, about half the time. They send it out to specialists. Okay? When they are overturned, it's absolutely a judgment call. Back to the radiology pre-auth, the mother may I, the gatekeeper type of situation. Um, we're one of the last places in the country that has installed this type of programming. Our expenses in radiology, 07 to 08, or 06 to 07, looking forward to 08, are going up at 17 percent per year. Okay. So we said, you know, what's going on here? So we, you know, we grabbed a little bit of data. It looked like 30 percent of the studies that were being done were for duplicates, higher cost studies were lower cost or equally effective, or the study simply didn't make sense. How do we make that judgment? We went to the American College of Radiology guidelines. We went to the profession itself and said, against the data, does it make sense or not? And when you have that type of number out there, how could you ignore it? So now we have the hassle factor, which I am very concerned about. And when this thing first rolled out, it was a disaster. It was a complete disaster. I checked this morning coming over, a call to that call center, four second wait time. I wish my call center operated that well. Okay. If you need to have, and, and that's the, to the nurse, okay, the nurse can't deny. It's a warm transfer to a physician, 14 seconds till you get to a physician. Average length of call, about four and a half minutes. Against the 17% inflation, I don't know how we can't do that. Yeah. Going back to Sandy's comments about the economic security, I don't know how we can't take that type of action. We're at group number four, Isaiah McKnight. Uh, my question is, how can, the medical, how can the medical community at large shift from a um, model of illness to a model of healthy living and prevention? Okay. Nancy, do you want to start with that one? Okay. Um, that's a wonderful question, and I, I think that uh, it's something that we're very interested in doing. Um, I think it's going to take us a long time, and I think it's going to take the involvement not only of the uh, medical care system, but also of our communities at large. We really need to ask the question and, and look at the facts about what is really causing us to be ill and look at basic causes rather than looking at outcomes. You know, if I asked everyone in this room what the number one cause of death in the United States is, you would probably tell me heart disease. But if you think about it, heart disease is not a cause, it's an outcome. And we need to ask the question, what is the cause of the heart disease, and then begin to address those issues. And it's a real switch for us in this country. I mean, we have focused all of our time, energy, and funding on treatment parts of the health care system. And we really need to shift to thinking about prevention. And as Lisa mentioned, not just secondary prevention, which is diagnosing something early and treating it early, but primary prevention, preventing it from happening in the first place. But again, that's not something the health care system can do by itself. It's something that we need to do as a community. We need to demand that the healthcare system support that and provide access in ways uh, that it needs to to preventive health services. But there's a lot of other things that the community as a whole needs to do. We need to redesign our communities so that we can take walks in the evening. We need to make our streets safe so that we can be outside our houses and our children can be physically active. We need to make sure that everyone in our community has access to healthy food. We need to make sure that we have legislative solutions that makes it uh, harder to buy cigarettes, for example, or harder to buy trans fat, fatty foods. Um, we need to really think about coming at this problem from every angle. Thank okay, you. let me uh, go to uh, uh, Joe on the legislation part of it, and then Fran and Sandy. 
Well, I, I th it's a, a great point, and um, one of the things that you know, I, I'm reminded of over and over again is how difficult all of this is to resolve without people being willing to sacrifice something. Um, and the, the conversation, for instance, around trans fats or, or smoking or how, how, how you legislate personal responsibility, to Fran's point much earlier, because it is about personal responsibility. And people are resistant to change. So if we were to pass legislation saying that you can't have trans fats in restaurants, which they've done, I believe, in New York City, and, and it's, it's, it's uh, frankly, I think it's the wave of the future. It's going to happen. Uh, you know, you hear from people, the same people who will complain about the cost of health insurance will be the ones complaining that the legislature and the governor have decided to limit their personal choices. And it, it's just interesting because I don't think we're going to get to a point where we have affordable, accessible health care without virtually everyone in our society giving up something. And the question is, are people prepared to make the sacrifice to have that. David talked about um, in, in other industrialized nations, talked about England, where you can jump the queue in terms of, of, of the weight for a procedure if you have private dollars. Here, in a society and in a country where we, we sort of value individualized, uh, you know, everything is individual freedoms, and, that, and, that, and that's sort of the hallmark of our, our, our lives and our governance for 200 years. The notion, though, that you'd have to get permission and stand in line for certain kinds of health care is going to be difficult for people to accept. So I think legislatively we are coming more. We obviously have made significant changes as it relates to the purchase of tobacco, purchase of alcohol, and we get complaints as soon as we do it, we'll get complaints. We mandate people have to have se uh, seat belts. We mandate you're not allowed to talk on the telephone, uh, something we probably all violate while you're driving. But those are restrictions on personal freedoms, um, but they do go away towards reducing the cost or at least um, uh, uh, reducing the increased cost of premiums. The question is, when we're all done with this discussion over the next several years, if we're ever done with it, um, but as we focus more on it, part of the question for me and those of us who are elected to serve um, and have to make the choices of, boy, do I want to tell my constituents that they can't have this and hopefully in return they get uh, reduced premiums or more level premiums. And I think it's a, a question that's not easy to come to because people have, uh, it, it's easy to talk and it's easy for all of us in this room to sort of talk about what the future would be. It's much more difficult for us to all to be willing to make personal sacrifices. Um, and Al, you didn't mention it, but I've lost 15 pounds because my doctor said, you're in great health, but you should lose about 10 pounds. So I've taken some personal responsibility. It's, uh, you know, that's... Well, Joe... Uh, I thought uh, you'd mention I, it. But. I'm going to tell you the truth. If you first came in, I said, boy, he got a haircut. I know where all, <laughs> I know where all that weight went. There you go. Okay. Uh, Fran, you're next, and then Sandy. You know, I, I really think this is the best question. And what I want to say is I think the next by the people should be all about this. And I do think it's where we all have to come together. And the governor did start the, the whole conversation by saying we should build or have this, the health care system we need, not the health care system we have. But there's a lot of things that we need to change along the way. We have to change the financing. We have to really make it so that people, that there is as easy as can be for people to go look at promotion, go to primary care, understand prevention. And we at the Finger Lakes HSA just have 22 different um, coalitions and committees and task forces. What we find is two of them, the African American and the Latino coalitions are desperate for information, want to understand how to take personal responsibility. So I think the community's ready. I think a lot of things need to change. But I think that the community, all of you are here today because you know the system's broken. You're willing to take part of the responsibility to fix it. But I think a whole lot of other things have to change, too. Thank you. Uh, Sandy. I mentioned that uh, one of the initiatives that we started about 18 months ago was looking at what could we as a community do to help to control um, health care costs and to be a healthier community. And one of the uh, areas that we focused on and an area I think that employers can be very helpful on is supporting wellness initiatives within their organizations. And uh, just to, uh, this past spring, we sponsored a program you may have read about in the newspaper called Eat Well, Live Well. And it, very simple, eat uh, fresh fruits and vegetables and get off your duff and start walking. So it's steps and healthy food. 
And we had over uh, 90 employers uh, in, in the community and 40,000 people that were counting steps and trying to eat five cups of fruits and vegetables every day. Wegmans loved, the, loved this. This is a Wegmans program, actually, that they really have given to the community. And, um, and I think you're going to see more and more employers embracing this. I think schools are becoming much more um, aware of the fact that the meals that they serve kids have to be healthier foods. My guess is if you go into um, your um, canteen areas, you'll see the, the machines. Uh, you're seeing perhaps less chips and crackers and more apples and fresh 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 fruits, and those are the things I think that we, we, we as a community can do long term. It's going to take us some time, but I think in the long run, that's the kind of effort that we need to be, become healthier. Uh, Tim, let, let give you the last comment. Yeah, uh, very, very quickly. Uh, your question is how to shift from an illness model to a prevention model, and I think the way to look at this is perhaps to look at models that have already done so. And it's relatively simple, if you'll excuse the overgeneralization. If you have a fee-for-service orientation to health care, Where's the money? It's in providing the service for people who are already ill. Those countries that don't have a fee-for-service orientation to providing health care spend more on prevention and so have many more fewer illnesses to deal with in the long run. If it's a fee-for-service, for-profit system, you're going to treat people who are already ill more regularly than those who are needing prevention and don't become ill in the first place. We have Colleen Flynn. In our group, we had many interpretations of one um, subject. So we were asking, how would you define universal health care, and what impact would it have on our region? I think it's, it's, it's a difficult concept to, to really wrap your, your mind around, basically because of the way we have um, provided health care in this country up until now. David has talked about the system in, in England, and yes, there are queues, and there are also things that you get denied, and there are services that you cannot have if you're older and sicker and have more complicated disease, and those are things that we're not necessarily ready to, to accept in this country. Um, if you, I spent some time in Africa recently, and uh, I asked, you know, where are the heart disease patients and the chronic diabetics and, you know, their issue is we're, our patients are dying of HIV and AIDS and we don't see chronic illness. We're more attuned to prevention and, and acute care. Uh, so I think universal access or universal care would have to be a system and I'm not sure that having one payer is the right answer because I think that limits your ability to have a free market society and really make sure that you're providing adequate care and to bring in some of the resources that David talked about earlier. But I think you need to have a system where everybody is able to, uh, to access basic services and that at least means access to a primary care physician with prevention model and incentives um, for prevention. I mean, Blue Cross and Blue Shield just started a program called Healthy Blue, I think is the name of it, if I can give them a plug, because I've been saying this for the longest time. Incentivize people who are doing the things that, that they need to do. It makes me crazy. If I tell you that you're diabetic and you're hypertensive and you have heart disease and I need to help you lose 10 pounds and you look at me and say, forget it, and you go buy McDonald's or Burger King or whatever, and when I have a young mother that comes in and they're, t they're taking their two-year-old and their five-year-old out to eat fast food because they have forgotten how to cook and they can't go by the public market and get fresh vegetables. We've become a fast food society. So I think we need to have basic access, but we also need to teach people to be healthier as we're doing that. Well, Lisa, a terrific response. And Lisa, Lisa, if I could ask you next time, if you would speak directly into that microphone a little bit. Yes. You focus on the person, and you're leaning closer and closer to that person and farther away from the microphone. Okay, I'm, I'm saving David and Tim. Is there someone else that uh, would like to uh, comment on that? I uh, just, from, from a, you know, the, the question of public policy of what universal coverage is, it, it, it's, it's a great question because I think we all have different ideas of what that will be, and I, I agree um, with Dr. Harris that certainly preventive care, primary care has to be a part of universal coverage. I would also argue that catastrophic care has to be a part of universal coverage so that when you have a, an episode that's significant, whether it's, it's a, a, a having cancer or being involved in, in, in some kind of accident, that you really need as a part of universal coverage to have catastrophic care as well. It's the part in between I think that there's going to be some debate about, but I would argue that in order for you to really effectively have universal coverages, and it may be um, I think this is another question we'll grapple with is whether or not it has to be mandated so that everyone in society has to have coverage. Because if you choose to opt out, um, let's assume that affordability is not the issue. Let's assume we put enough public programs in there. But with the ability to opt out, you do leave exposure for everyone else in the pool of insured to cover your health care if something happens. So it's, it's, it's likely to at least 
I, I think it's going to look like mandatory care. I think it's going to be primary and preventive, and I think it's going to be catastrophic. And then I think there'll be debates about what other pieces of it fill in to, to be considered universal. Uh, if we agree that universal access is a, a political and social good, then I think a universal system is the appropriate outcome. But the actual arrangements can't be brought wholesale over from any system that somebody else already deploys. We are a different place. Uh, I think one of the things that we have as an advantage is precisely, and this I think is David's point, um, we have a lot of different kinds of experiences trying to finance health care in a variety of states, all of which have very, very different difficulties. Uh, I don't think there is a one system that fits all, but I certainly think a state-by-state -state system driven in the universal direction is the appropriate system to seek. Uh, Dave, uh, some quick comments. I'm not uh, at variance with either Joe or, or Tim on this one. I think it's primary prevention catastrophic. I think it needs to have a local focus. I think it needs to have, uh, as I've said a number of times, you know, a number of sources of financing and a number of sources of payment. I think the devil is in the details. And uh, you know, if it was easy, it would have been done. I'm WXXI Television News Director Julie Phillip, and you've been watching a special edition of Need to Know featuring part of a day-long dialogue about health care at Rochester Institute of Technology. This is the final part of a three-part series. To find out more about By the People, go to our website, wxxi.org slash btp. By the People is a special initiative organized by McNeil Lair Productions to bring the views of informed ordinary citizens to a national discussion on the important issues of the day. BTP is partnering with the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation on the Dialogues in Democracy Project. Ongoing BTP project funding partners include the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. By the People is nonpartisan and doesn't support any particular policy, position, or viewpoint. Its sole purpose is to encourage informed dialogue.